We've covered a lot of geopolitical mm -hmm. stuff here. Um, going back to the original mm -hmm. uh, title of the article, the future geopolitical order and Bitcoin initial mm -hmm. assessment. So what is the role of Bitcoin in all of this? What is the potential? What is your thesis here? Yeah, so I could see it play out in different ways. One in particular, so Bitcoin just as a monetary network and as a um, uh, neutral reserve asset has very valuable properties that could make it play like a role in a system that is lacking this type of um, trust in the legacy fiat issuers and also trust uh, and also lacks trust in like the rising challenge, right? Like I don't think people are necessarily going to trust the Chinese yuan or Chinese government bonds any more than they trust dollars or U.S. Treasury securities. Even if they sort of have to hedge in this bipolar system, doesn't mean they're going to like shift to the yuan as like the new top dog, right? Um, and, 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 and possibly trust it less, but have to use it. Yeah, they, and again, but you can, and so you could see like a, a, a rebalancing, right? But it doesn't mean the dollar is going to lose its overall dominance. Um, but it does mean that there's a role for something like Bitcoin to take take sort of a different position in uh, the sort of asset allocation portfolio for sovereign wealth managers, right? So if you're taking the perspective of someone in, say, Qatar or another GCC country that's looking across their sovereign wealth funds and saying, okay, I've got X amount of Western equities, X amount of Western and other real estate. I've got these mines. I've got, you know, these just basic dollar balances and deposits and, and U.S. Tre Treasury security holdings. It's not an insane proposition for me to, to put forward that them allocating some small percentage to Bitcoin in the next several years, you know, is not a possibility, right? And, and you can imagine them taking like a flyer on it, right, to start. Um, but there is this sort of dynamic where, okay, they're going to experiment with it. They're going to test it out. But if a few do it in a small scale, it could, be, so it could become successful. And I think their alternatives are not that great, but, you know, there's a great paper by... Um, a Harvard uh, you know, econ graduate named Matthew Ferranti. And it's a very technical kind of mathematical paper. It's a model, like all models that has assumptions that you could argue with, but it's a good kind of first rigorous attempt to try to um, put some math behind this question of as the sort of geopolitical risk premium goes up from say sanctions risk to countries that are marginally geopolitically disaligned with the United States, how, how would you expect that to change their portfolio allocation away from say fiat reserves to both gold and Bitcoin. And he has this model and he plugs in different assumptions and you can do kind of the parameter space and see, okay, if it's a high risk, you know, or the different, you know, assumptions about Bitcoin versus gold, you get a different distribution. But like the bottom line of the model is like, you know, even in like a more conservative scenario, you get to like a single digit percentage allocation kind of makes sense from like a risk weighted perspective to, to some of those countries. Um, and so that's like an interesting, like that's interesting, like, thesis to have. Um, we need to talk to this guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you should. Um, and he can certainly explain his model better than I can. Uh, but that, that puts something on the board that I don't think was, was on the board before. Um, and it changes the dynamic because a lot of these countries, one, like can't custody their own gold, right? So I think like people will just go to gold as an, as an alternative, but gold actually has a lot of disadvantages. The reason why gold failed as a global monetary um, reserve asset is because it's difficult to transport, to secure, to verify, um, it means it's like usually ends up being centralized in the global hegemonic vaults anyways, like most gold is right now. I think most, uh, you know, most of the gold in the world is held uh, in 66 Liberty Street, you know, underneath the, you know, underneath the New York Fed. Do we believe that? Uh, well, I don't know. You know, die hard. What would have that, that, that <laughs> the, uh, the, the robbery ticket. with a vengeance. Yeah. Um, but yeah, literally. And so like, you know, if you're worried about the treasury securities that you hold being seized, like, well, then the gold in a vault and the New York Fed doesn't help you at all, right? Um, so unless you're prepared to actually self-custody your gold, which is a pretty, you know, like Saudi Arabia could do that. Some of these big Gulf powers could do that. But like the average sort of emerging market, it's going to be expensive. And sometimes it may, may, may not make a whole lot of sense just to transact in this. Like, so it's like the, the uh, it doesn't, uh, it starts to add a whole lot of frictional cost. Um, even if it was like a necessity, it would just, it would, quickly become unworkable, I think, for a lot of those countries. And they would have to resort to the same sort of thing, which is paper claims on the gold that are held by some other power on your behalf. And you're just, you know, choosing a different sovereign to sort of derogate, um, to sort of derogate your, uh, your monetary sovereignty to. Um, so Bitcoin is an interesting uh, alternative because you don't have to take all those settlement, um, uh, you know, frictional costs 
because it's just a digitally native asset that you can just transfer over this um, Cedrus persistent network. And it's super easy to ch and cheap to self custody with like high level security equivalent to gold security to a certain extent if you have good custody practices. So this is a different type of asset whose sort of monetary properties, you know, scarcity and its sort of bare nature make it like gold to a certain extent. But its settlement, um, as, as a settlement system, it's got the sort of uh, efficiencies of the traditional fiat system. So it's kind of mixing a SWIFT and a Fedwire with the treasury security into one kind of standalone package. Um, now it's very speculative, right? So that's got to be priced in, right? This is what Matt does in the model is, okay, like clearly Bitcoin is much more volatile than, than any other like current sovereign reserve asset. So it would be foolhardy to allocate like a large portion of your, um, of your, uh, of your holdings to it. But, uh, but yeah, but like a small few percentage points to start, uh, especially for folks that have a high sanctions risk and that otherwise can't self-custody gold, like the model says it makes sense to do that. Um, and that's, I think, how you could see it start. And that's like anything else, right? Like start small and then as, as, as the market grows because of that initial sort of um, capital injection, like f in my basic under you know, assumptions about Bitcoin's volatilities, it will generally correspond to adoption and size, right? It just takes more inflows and outflows to cause the same level of price movement. So as it gets larger, volatility kind of has to come down to a certain yeah. extent. Yeah. Um, so as volatility comes down, it becomes, you know, the risk premium associated with the volatility also comes down, which means, you know, your uh, portfolio allocation is more goes up, right? Yeah, yeah. And so that's, that's how you could see this play out, right? Which is why, you know, I wouldn't ascribe like 100% probability to that. Um, but I think it's not being looked at properly as like a realistic scenario. Say by 2030, you could have several countries that have um, you know meaningful holdings of Bitcoin, um, you know, as part of this you know <laughs> rejigger geoeconomic arrangement. And this is like a way for them to hedge. Do you think the U.S. government should be encouraging this? Though? Well, so this is the key thing, right? I think this is a ace in the hole for U.S. geostrategic interests to a certain extent that we can leverage Bitcoin's monetization with uh, stablecoin growth. This is a whole separate conversation, but like you can imagine the competition between uh, Bitcoin isn't really with the US dollar, it's with US treasury security and, comp and competitors for US treasury security, namely gold. Um, but you don't have to give up the dollar's preeminence uh, uh, in the process. You can leverage you know, what is very strong endogenous demand for dollars around the world via you know, crypto dollars, right? So stablecoins. Um, and a synergistic relationship can emerge between uh, demand in a lot of these countries for dollars that are really hard to get. They would not; they would rather transact in crypto dollars, like uh, Tether and other versions of, like that could come down the line, than like the digital you want. And that uh, spreads demand for dollars. And if you have a proper regulatory framework for stablecoins that reserves them, um, you know, so you don't get these like stablecoin blows up uh, you know, or sort of frauds. Uh, that you could you know, see dollarization take place in a much more stable way around the world than actually it happens today. Right now, dollarization is a very unstable process uh, offshore, right? It is you know, your dollar balance, uh, balances that are like hot money flows um, and they rely on treasury security collateral. And so when you have runs in the offshore dollar system, it's the treasury securities that get fire sold. And that's what causes the Fed to come out with these swap lines and liquidity facilities and repo facilities to reliquify the offshore dollar system to prevent like a total collapse of the monetary region. So we've created this like this gun to our own head by 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 making the treasury security critical collateral for the offshore dollar system. That dollar system has to keep expanding. That puts a lot more fragility on their treasury security that is uh, a source of geoeconomic vulnerability to us. So having stable coins monetize alongside Bitcoin, it also doesn't hurt, help, uh, hurt the fact that Americans hold a lot more Bitcoin than yeah. a lot of other countries in the world. So if Bitcoin monetizes relative to other countries, it's essentially just a form of like seniorage, right? Yeah. Because their capital inflows to buy Bitcoin, you know, make our Bitcoin worth more. And so we accrue value, right? From their capital inflows into the overall network. And also control a lot of the infrastructure in terms of a lot of the major companies are, have been established in the US, mm -hmm. are being established in the US. So it gives a lot more control there as well. A bit like with the internet. Yeah, I mean, control is an interesting dynamic. It's when not it comes controller to, yeah. than the network of the code as such, but do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, well, I, I think when it comes to like what sort of value system does Bitcoin represent? It represents a system of you know, like individual 
autonomy, right? The, the ability to transact peer-to-peer, -peer, the idea that you, know, you have property rights, you can custody what you want, um, like reinforces the ability to like, uh, express yourself. Like these are sort of like natural liberal values um, that are sort of antithetical to the system that China's trying to set up, right? So you can imagine this is like in alignment with US like political interests. Um, but you also have a challenge with the fact that you know, China is trying to impose their political views you know, in this sort of subtle way by exporting their sort of technology stack. Um, and Bitcoin is sort of, you know, represents like a very sort of diametrically opposed vision of a technology stack for a new internet, right? The internet has sort of become more centralized, more, you know, with surveillance built into it, right? And I think people see, you know, the trend lines of, um, you know, tech balkanization um, being a major issue, right? Where data localization is going to be a major thing. You know, tech companies are going to have to locate data, say, on Indian users in India. Their algorithms are going to be subject to state review and approval. I think this sort of open era of the internet that people still maybe think exists is, is going to die. <laughs> um, and I think Bitcoin represents the sort of last hope that maybe you can have something still like a global open internet. Um, and it may not represent, you know, this is, I think, what some of the work with like Web5 is about, right? Not the Web3 nonsense, but, you know, actually building in decentralized identity applications and, and building in other, other applications on top of the basic network that can, you know, create, you know, a different type of internet than, than what we've sort of evolved into that is maybe not, you know, fully aligned with our, our, our moral or our political interests. Um, yeah, and it helps the fact that, you know, Bitcoin companies are here. Bitcoin innovators are here. Um, I think people have a lot of, you know, I think Bitcoin's kind of a trigger word. People start to think about it as like associated with people they don't like or political ideologies they don't like. I look at it as just like a technology stack um, that is going to potentially offer us a, you know, a novel geopolitical solution slash backup plan <laughs> um, in case our adversaries succeed in, in, uh, in, in destabilizing the current geoeconomic arrangement. Um, and yeah, I think we need to be seeking how we can you know, use it to our advantage. Um, and, and not just our advantage, but advantage of everyone around the world, right? If you think about what the function of a global reserve asset is, is it's something that you hold your savings in and what you think is the safest you know, thing, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the dollar via treasury securities was like that for institutions, right? But like the average person in emerging market, even the average American doesn't hold a US treasury security, right? I mean, only like, like so a subset of people that actually hold like money market funds are sophisticated enough or even have enough free capital to like invest can hold bonds. But the vast majority of the world can't hold a treasury security. And so that like, I think implicitly, you know, weights the power dynamic towards large institutions, especially in countries where the institutions are not all that, you know, liberal, right? And so it puts a lot of the power in these, in these countries, you know, into the hands of those, you know, elite, um, structures like the sovereign wealth funds, the central banks, the government elites, and the people don't have access to those resources. They just sort of get managed by, by the political system. Um, it's oftentimes not on their behalf. And so Bitcoin offers a premise of like, here's a global reserve asset that's like global reserve asset for the people. Like an individual can hold a tiny amount of Bitcoin on their phone, uh, can also has it with like dollar-based stable coins, and can you know, engage in a global marketplace, maybe with these other applications, and do an end run around their oppressive um, government. Uh, it's like, that's, that's pretty encouraging. Also, like, more speculative, but, like, really encouraging is, is a company called, um, called Bridger Solutions that is just starting up uh, mining operations in Africa. And they're, you know, going to scout these, uh, you know, these, these, you know, power facilities that, like, have been funded by Chinese loans, like, major, like, hydro and wind farms that, you know, were built because of some vanity or political uh, reason. And now they have no interconnection to any, any load center. So it's like 50, 100 megawatt wind farms, hydropower uh, plants, just stranded assets basically. And, you know, oh, perfect place for Bitcoin miners to go, help the local community essentially monetize these assets. I think it was a company <coughs> called, called Gridless in, in Kenya doing these things. And yeah, like, we, uh, we tried yeah. to speak to, what's his name? Eric. Eric, yeah. We tried mm -hmm. to speak to him and he, uh, 
we agreed to do the show remotely, obviously, mm-hmm. because he's in, uh, I think it was in Kenya or something at the mm-hmm. time. And I think he kind of did it with an iPhone <laughs> on top of a hill and we could see like like this. It was at strike. the actual facility. Yeah, it was at the yeah. facility, but like the connection was shit. So we've had to defer it. But we got to get the guy on we'll the show. Yeah. Next week. Uh, next week, yeah. We're going to get him on the phone. Yeah, so, so these Bridger guys, they, they actually come from U.S. military and the State Department. Okay. So they actually worked in Africa for many years. Like they know the political terrain and they know like how Africa has become the site of geoeconomic uh, great power competition between US, Russia, and China operating in these countries, control over natural resources, trying to influence the host government. Um, and here these are like, well, they're also Bitcoiners, but they're like, hey, like we can essentially like take the Chinese funded asset, mine Bitcoin with it, and it's American company doing it, right? Like this it. is this is like, and we're, and we're basically teleporting the Bitcoin out from, you know, the middle of the jungle, right? And so you don't have the traditional problems of like getting like a traditional... Like if you want to monetize that sort of in, you know resource in those countries, it's challenging, right? You've got to get the inputs out, and you've got to get them, you know, get them in, then get them out, yeah. cross borders, etc. Bitcoin is like a novel sort of commodity in the sense that you can monetize these assets in these countries, uh, and then essentially teleport them out. Um, uh, and yeah, so I think that's a, and you can do this. You know, I think they're doing some, you know, looking at setting up some pilots to do this. So, uh, uh, but that's a, I think, interesting like alignment between you know, monetizing Chinese funded uh, <laughs> renewable energy projects that are not actually helping the local communities, you know, with Bitcoin mining in a way that, you know, reinforces, you know, American values and American economic interests in these countries that are the site of intense geopolitical, you know, like influence. Like this is like speculative. It's not like game changing. This isn't going to like tip the balance of scales between the US and China by any means, but like that's like an underplayed, you it's know, funny. Yeah. It's like, it's like, that's kind of crazy, right? Yeah. That you'd think that was, that was possible.